Welcome back to the Bible, day 62, divine authority and worship. In this evening's study, we'll delve into the profound themes of divine authority and worship, which will be revealed in our reading in Psalms 29 and Mark 11 and Mark 12, and also in Leviticus chapter 9 and chapter 10. In our reading in Psalm 29, it will magnify the majestic authority of God, calling all creation to worship him in reverence and awe. In our readings in Mark 11, verse 27 through Mark 12, verse 12, it will present Jesus' confrontation with religious authorities, highlighting his divine authority and teachings on true worship. In our readings in Leviticus 9 and 10, provides insights into the solemn duties of the priesthood and the significance of prayer by God's commands. These passages illuminate the essence of divine authority, the call to authentic worship, and the responsibilities of those entrusted with the sacred text the sacred tax of leading God's people in prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to ask the Lord. And now we're going to ask the Lord to shine into our hearts so love your master, the pure life of your divine knowledge. And note up the eyes of our mind that we may understand your teachings in the scriptures. And help us to apply what we learn that you're having conquered sinful desires. We may pursue a spiritual way of life, thinking and doing all the things that are pleasing to you. Your Christ, our God, you are light, and to you and your glory. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, now and forever, in endless ages. Amen. Lord is our shepherd. All right, good evening. Welcome back. So great is his faithfulness. Indeed, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Christ is truly in our midst. The true definition of minister is to serve someone else's will. My pleasure to bring you all God's word each and every day. We ask in prayer, right? We ask in prayer. We're tapping into the first person of the Trinity. Right? We ask in prayer, we ask the prayer to the Father, just like Jesus used to pray to the Father. And when we seek, we seek God's truth in the scriptures. And by seeking God's truth in the scriptures, we tap into the second person of the Trinity, to Jesus Christ, because that's where you'll find his son. And then lastly, by knocking, by knocking, you're doing God's will. And you're tapping into the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. It's through the Holy Spirit that we do, or it's through the Holy Spirit that we do our good works and deeds and we imitate Christ to so welcome back the true minister, the true definition of minister is to serve someone else's will. It's my pleasure for his reading this evening from wisdom Psalms 29 verses one through 11, get our screen shared over. We're going to get right into it. Thank you all again for following. All right, here we go. So Psalms 29, praise God. And his holiness and majesty, a psalm of David. And it says, Give unto the Lord, oh, you mighty ones, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord, his beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The, the God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon and makes them also skip like a calf. Lebanon is surrounded like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness to gash. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everyone says glory. The Lord set his throne at the flood. And the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Beautiful. So our reading this evening here in Psalms, verse 1 through 11, here in Psalms 29. It's a powerful depiction of what God's majestic authority and the call to worship him in what reverence. Just like we said in the, in the opening introduction. So let's look at verse 1 and 2. It starts out by saying, Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. And worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. So the psalm begins with a call to give what glory and strength to what the Lord. And provides the importance of worshiping God and his splendor and holiness. Which sets the tone for the theme of worshiping God with reverence and all. Just like we said in the introduction. Look at verses 3 and 4. The voice the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice the Lord is powerful. 
The voice, the Lord, is full of majesty. So the voice of the Lord is described as powerful and majestic, symbolizing his, his, his divine authority over all creation. The imagery of thunderstorm and mighty waters portray God's greatness and supremacy. Let's look at verses five and six. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon, and he makes them also skip like a calf. Lebanon is Sarai, like a young wild ox. So the impact of God's voice is depicted through its ability to what break and shake the earth. Hmm? Kind of gives me a reminiscent, right, of the divine authority displayed in the creation narrative in Genesis chapter one. We'll read the first few verses. And it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void. And the darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw light and that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. It's a beautiful, beautiful description of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. It was empty. It was chaos. It was dead. It was nothing but death in the beginning. And the darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of the God, spirit this end, the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said, What well, let there be light? Light, like giving life, right? From death to life. Isn't it beautiful? All right. Look at verse seven. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The mention of the Lord glory highlights God's majestic authority as a source of honor and majesty. Look at verse 8 and 9. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord, the Lord shakes the wilderness at Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And his holy temple, everyone says glory. The imagery shifts to the wilderness, symbolizing desolation and chaos. Yet even there, God's voice brings forth powerful transformations, signifying his sovereignty over all situations. In verse 10, the Lord set a throne at the flood. And the Lord sits as king forever. Beautiful. The psalmist calls on all to recognize and worship the Lord, acknowledging his eternal reign and authority over heaven and earth. Beautiful. Beautiful. Look at verse 11. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. The psalm concludes with a prayer of God's strength. Beautiful and blessing upon his people, reinforcing the connection between divine authority and the worship of God in all circumstances. Beautiful, beautiful. Here are some spiritual teachings from Psalm 29. It teaches us the importance of worshiping God and acknowledging his power and glory. The psalm emphasizes the transformative impact of God's voice, highlighting his ability to bring order out of chaos and bring about his divine purposes. The imagery of God's voice and its effects in Psalms 29 parallels the creation narrative in Genesis 1, where God spoke the world, where God, where God spoke word brings forth creation. The theme of God's voice shaking the earth resonates with the passages we see in Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 through 17. The sixth seal, cosmetic services. I looked up and when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black and soft sackcloth of air, hair. And the moon became like blood. The stars of heaven fell to the earth as the fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. And the sky receded as a scroll when it rolled up. And every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings, the earth, and great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave of every free man hid themselves in the caves. In the rocks, the mountains, instead of the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Beautiful. Beautiful. So the theme of God's voice, right? Shaking the earth resonates with the passage right there in Revelation chapter 6. Beautiful. That was depicting the final judgment and the power of God's voice. In our breakdown of Psalms 9, 
It aligns with the divine authority and worship theme, which was presented in the beginning of our study. It provides in God's supreme authority and the call to worship him with reverence and all. It's beautiful. Our New Testament reading this evening, starting in Mark 11 and verse 27. Jesus' authority, question, gave the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. When they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? But Jesus answered and said to them, I also ask you one question. Then answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, then why then did not believe him? If we say from men, they feared the people. For all counted John to have been a prophet indeed. So they answered and said to Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus answered and said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. The parable of the wicked vine dressers. Mark chapter 12. Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the vine, for the wine vat, and built a tower. And he released it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now vintage time he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. They took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. And again he sent them another servant. And at him they threw stones, wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully treated. And again he sent another. Again, and him they killed. And many others beating some and killing some. Therefore still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them, last saying, they will respect my son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give them, give the vineyard to others. Yet not even, yet you not even read the scripture. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them. So they let him and went away. You know, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. All right. So this evening's reading in Mark provides insights into what Jesus' authority and teachings on worship. So let's look at verses 27 through 33, right here in Mark 11. So it's talking about what Jesus' authority is questioned, right? So here, the religious leaders, right, they were questioning Jesus' authority. And he responds with his own question about what John the Baptist, right? So Jesus is revealing the source of authority from God. This exchange underscores Jesus' divine authority, central what to our theme this evening. Right? It's beautiful. Going into Mark chapter 12 and verses 1 through 9. So verses 1 through 9. The parable, the vineyard. So here we Jesus, we, we see Jesus telling a parable about tenants in the vineyard. Here is symbolizing God's people who have rejected his what? Messengers, his prophets, right? Messengers, including prophets, right? So this parable reflects what God's authority as the vineyard's owner and highlights the consequences of what rejecting God's authority, right? In verses 10 and 11, right here, it says, Have you not even read this in Scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is what the Lord is doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them. So they left him and went away. So Jesus is quoting Psalms 8. So here in verses 10 and 11, Jesus is quoting Psalms 118 verses 22 through 23, right? And it says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. So it's referring to himself as rejected stone becomes the cornerstone. This points to his divine authority and the, and the fulfillment of prophecies regarding the Messiah. In verse 12, back in Mark, 
The religious leaders realized the parable's meaning, but chose to reject Jesus' authority, leading to what? Further conflicts. They ignored it. Spiritual teachings and understanding. Jesus' authority comes from God. His teachings and actions reflect divine authority. The parable of the vineyard emphasizes God's authority over his people. The consequences of rejecting his messengers and the ultimate rejection of his son, Jesus Christ. The, re the religious leaders' re rejection of Jesus' authority highlights the tension between human and divine authority. Biblical parallels can also be seen in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. God's disappointing vineyard. Right? Now let me sing to my, to my well-beloved a song of beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out in stones and planted it with a choice vine. He built a, he built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, oh, oh inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I'll take away its edge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay its waste. I shall not be pruned or dug. But there shall come a briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain, that they rain, no, no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the man of Judah and his pleasant plan. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. Beautiful. Beautiful. So this reflects what the Old Testament theme of God as the owner of the vineyard, his people, and the responsibility to what bear fruit. Jesus, as rejected cornerstone, connects the passage with Psalms 118, verses 22 through 23. We saw that. Let's look at Isaiah 28, verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Right? This was improvising his pivotal role in God's plan for salvation despite rejection by some. All right. So Leviticus starting in chapter 9. We'll end in chapter 10, verse 20. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The priestly ministry begins. It came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron, his sons, and the elders of Israel. And he said to Aaron, take for yourself a young bull as a sin offering and a ram as a burnt offering without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. And the children of the Israel, you shall speak, saying, take a kid of the goats as a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering. Also a bull and ram and peace offering to sacrifice before the Lord, the grain offering mixed with oil, for the day the Lord will appear to you. So they brought what Moses commanded before the tabernacle of meeting, and all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. Then Moses said this thing, which the Lord commanded you to do, and the glory of the Lord will appear to you. And Moses said to Aaron, go to the altar, offer your sin offering and your burnt offering, and make atonement for yourself and for the people. Offer the offering of the people and make atonement for them as the Lord commanded. Aaron therefore went to the altar and killed the calf and the sin offering, which was for himself. Then the sons of Aaron brought the blood to him, and he dripped his finger in the blood, put on the horns of the altar, and poured the blood at the base of the altar. But the fat, the kidneys, the fatty loaf, and the liver of the sin offering, he burned on the altar as the Lord had commanded Moses. The flesh and the hide he burned with the fire outside the camp. He killed the burnt offering, and Aaron's sons presented to him the blood, which he sprinkled all around the altar. Then he presented the burnt offering to him with his pieces and head, and he burnt them on the altar. And he washed the entrails and the legs and burned them with the burnt offering on the altar. Then he brought the people's offering and took the goat, which was a sin offering for the people, and killed an offering for sin, like the first one. And he brought the burnt offering and offered it according to his prescribed manner. He brought he bought the grain offering, took a handful of it, and burnt it on the altar, the size of burnt sacrifice of the morning. He also killed the bull and the ram and sacrificed the peace offerings, which were for the people. And Aaron's sons presented to him the blood, which he sprinkled all around the altar. The fat from the bull and the ram, the fatty tail, 
what covers the entrails. And the kidneys, the fatty lobe, the cash, the liver. And they put the fat on the breast. Then he burned the fat on the altar. But the breast and the right thigh, Aaron, waved as a wave offering before the Lord, as Moses had commanded. Then Aaron lifted up his hand toward the people, blessed, blessed him, and came down from 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 offering the sin offering, the burnt offering, peace offering. And Moses and Aaron went to the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. The fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. The profane fire. Nabab and Ababu. Leviticus chapter 10. Then Nabu and Ababu. Then Nebadab and Ababu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them. They died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who came near me, I must be, re must be regarded as holy. Before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. Then Moses called to Michelle and Azaphim, the sons of Uzel, the uncle of Aaron. And he said to them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them by their tunics out of the camp. And Moses said, and Mo, and Mo, as Moses has said, And Moses said to Aaron and Eleazar and Tamar, his sons, Do not uncover your heads nor tear your clothes, lest you die in the wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren the whole house of Israel, be well the burning which the Lord has kindled. You shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the meeting, lest you die. For the anointing oil, the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. Conduct prescribed for priests. The Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink. You nor your sons with you. When you go into the tabernacle of the meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generation that you may distinguish between holy and unholy, between unclean and clean, that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. And Moses spoke to Aaron and Alisar and Tamar, the sons who were left. Take the grain offering that remains of the offering made by fire of the Lord, and eat it without leaven beside the altar, for it is most holy. You shall eat it in a holy place, because it is your due, and your sons due. The sacrifice is made by the fire of the Lord. So I have so I have been commanded. The breast, the wave offering, the thigh of the heave offering, you shall eat in, in a clean place, you, your sons, and your daughters with you. For they are your due and your sons' due, which are given from the sacrifices of the peace offering of the children of Israel. The thigh of the heave offering, the breast, the wave offering, they shall bring with the offerings of the fat made by fire. To offer as a wave offering before the Lord. It shall be yours and your sons with you by a statue forever, as the Lord has commanded. Then Moses made careful inquiry about the goat sin offering. And there it was burned up. And he was angry with Alasar and Tamar. The sons of Aaron were left saying, Why have you not eaten the sin offering in the holy place? Sin is most holy. And God has given it to you to bear the guilt of the congregation, to make an atonement for them before the Lord. See, its blood was not brought inside the holy place. Indeed, you should have eaten in a holy place, as I commanded. And Aaron said to Moses, look, this day they have offered their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord. And such things have befallen me. If I have eaten the sin offering today, would I have been accepted in the sight of the Lord? So when Moses heard that, he was content. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So our readings in Leviticus this evening provides us insights into the protocols and consequences of worship and divine authority. The context of the Old Testament priesthood. So in, the, in chapter 9, verses 1 through 24, it was talking about the consecration of Aaron and his sons. So that section described the consecration of Aaron and his sons as priests. It also emphasizes the importance of following God's specific instructions in worship, highlighting the reference and obedience required when it's serving God. And as we got to Leviticus 10, the first seven verses, Let's talk about the death of Nebab and Abu. So these were the what were sons of Aaron. They offered what unauthorized fire before the Lord, resulting in their death. This incident, this incident underscored how serious of a, the, the, the scenariousness 
of approaching God with reverence and following his prescribed worship methods. It also highlights the consequences of the, it also highlights the consequences of disregarding divine authority in prayer. In verses 8 through 20, as it finished up, restrictions and responsibilities for the priest. God instructs Aaron regarding the responsibilities and restrictions for priests, emphasizing the importance of maintaining holiness and, and distinguishing between the holy and the common. Spiritual teachings. So he taught the importance of approaching God with reverence and following his prescribed ways of worship, highlighting the seriousness of divine authority. That was that was our readings in 9 and 10 here. Following the death of Aaron's sons, it served as a warning about the consequences of offering worship that does not align with God's commands or lacks reverence for his authority. And the responsibility of the priests and restrictions emphasized the necessity of holiness and obedience in serving God and leading others in worship. Some biblical parallels. So the death of Aaron's sons, it parallels with the theme of reverence and obedience and worship seen in other passages, such as the story of Uzal touching the ark in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 6 through 7. All right, here we go. And when they came to Nishan's threshing floor, Uzal put his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it. For the oxen stumbled, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Saul, and God struck him there for his error, and he died there by the ark of God. So the consecration of Aaron and his sons, it also foreshadowed the priesthood of Jesus Christ, our ultimate high priest and meditator between God and humanity. Let's look at Hebrews. Chapter 4, verses 4 through 16, our compassionate high priest. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but what was at all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. May the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Our breakdown this evening here in Leviticus, it lines with the theme of divine authority and worship. By improvising the protocols, the consequences and responsibilities related to worship, the priesthood highlighting the importance of reverence, obedience, and adherence to God's authority in all aspects of prayer and in our daily lives. You know, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. So in this evening. All right, what a good study. And thank you all again for following. I sometimes, I have to, uh, I have a quick confession here. I sometimes almost go too fast, so I do apologize. I have to kind of like slow myself down. That's probably why I make a lot of mistakes, because I, I, I've been working on that, trying to slow down. But I get so into it, right? Myself, I sometimes almost confuse myself. But here's our blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be merciful to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, now and forever, sages. Amen. The Lord is our shepherd. We depart peace in the name of the Lord, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Peace be with you all. Go in peace. Shalom, shalom. May the Lord forgive those who love us and those who hate us. I love you all so much. Thank you for following. Have a blessed evening. It's Friday. Shabbat shalom. I love you all so much. All right. Have a good evening. I love you all. I'm out.